life is overwhelming. In the midst of our modern chaos, all the technology, all the demands, all the bills, the kids, the job, the marriage, it's easy to forget that our Bible is full of stories of people who found themselves overwhelmed too. From Hannah, the mother of Samuel, to Mary, the mother of Jesus. From Nehemiah, a builder, to Jesus, a carpenter. They all knew what it was like at times to carry an overwhelming sense of smallness. Though each circumstance was different, each reaction was the same. Some of the greatest prayers ever prayed. It's good to see you all today. Welcome, uh, Victorville. Welcome, VV. Welcome, Apple Valley. Welcome, Hesperia. Welcome, Phelan. All of our sites coming together each week uh, at this time in the service to hang out together, uh, albeit uh, with technology, and consider the Word of God. Well, I know everybody's had a good time to this point, and um, I hope we don't, we don't I hope we're not considered an interruption to your worship, but rather an enhancement as we look at the Word of God together. So we're going to just get into it. If you need a copy of the notes, raise your hand. Uh, actually, we won't just get into it. I want to just identify again what you've already heard and already know, but we have 800 students and leaders going uh, to camp this week uh, from all four of our sites, and uh, a lot of them did receive financial assistance from you all, so Props to HDC for being a church family that cares about kids, and uh, we know lives are going to be transformed, and we look forward to hearing about that. I am uh, donning, if I can use an old term, uh, the camp shirt that the senior hires are going to be uh, able to uh, enjoy uh, this week. So this week, as we are praying for them, you've got that little uh, card in your program today. As we're praying for them, uh, keep in mind uh, Pastor Tom's teal t-shirt and that the kids are all at camp and we're praying that God would do some miraculous things. Uh, also, for what it's worth, Pastor Ricky Jenkins will be with us again next weekend. Just thought I'd put it out there. So make sure you come back for the second part, second installment in this series that we've called affectionately, a called Overwhelmed. Uh, so, two brothers are arguing about which one was the most spiritual, which one prayed the most. So, one tried to make his point by saying to his brother, I bet you don't even know the Lord's Prayer. His brother said, yes, I do. First guy said, no, I, I don't think you do. <laughs> so, the other guy said, I do know the Lord's Prayer, and I'll prove it to you. Now, I lay me down to sleep, pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, pray the Lord my soul to take. First guy said, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't think you knew it. <laughs> maybe, maybe this is a biblical literacy test to know how many of y'all know the Lord's Prayer, but that wasn't it. <laughs> anyway, there are a lot of prayers that are famous in the Word of God, and maybe you have even prayed a lot of prayers in your life. It's not uncommon, by the way, for me <laughs> to talk to people who are not Jesus followers, but excuse that by saying, but I pray to God every day. Well, um, okay, whatever. I want you to know, though, that the best prayers you've prayed and the best prayers I've prayed are when we are at the end of our ropes. There's great passion in prayer at times. And, you know, we don't, we don't always want to go through those seasons of difficulty, but I tell you what, it does put you where you need to be, and that's on your knees before God. And we've all been there. Funny thing is, after... The issue that causes the crisis is resolved. We forget about prayer. I hope that is uh, something that we can um, fix this time around as we consider some of the greatest prayers ever prayed. You know, God's servants throughout history have been overwhelmed just like you, just like me. In fact, we've read their stories for as long as we've attended church. The word overwhelmed, described or defined, I should say, in the dictionary this way, being buried or drowned beneath a huge mass. That's what it means to be overwhelmed. But I want you to know, my friends, that being overwhelmed is a lot different than feeling 
overwhelmed. As Paul wrote the Romans, in Romans chapter 8, verse 31, he said, What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is on our side, what are we worried about? Right? See, no one who has ever placed their faith in Jesus, and this is the first principle of the day, nobody who's ever placed their faith in Jesus will ever be overwhelmed. But that doesn't always make the feeling go away, does it? We've got good theology, but man, we got those knots in our stomach still. And no matter what characterizes that burden or that weight, it seems like that feeling it squeezes out of us always is the same. And uh, so that's what we're going to address. Our prayers are best. Our prayers are most passionate when we're feeling emotionally spent. And so uh, I'm going to be honest with you, if I might. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I've been one of the pastors at HDC for over 30 years. Um, and I do have a little bit of influence here in terms of what topics we teach on the weekends. And I personally asked for this topic <laughs> uh, to teach. I knew I would be teaching uh, the majority of the messages in this series. As the schedule worked out, I just decided uh, we need to talk about prayer. Uh, I, I've been impressed with your leadership team over the last couple of years because we've been in transition at a number of different levels. Our vision has had to adjust. We've endured leadership changes based on our ever-evolving community or the communities that we serve here in the high desert. This community is becoming more and more ethnically diverse more and more economically difficult. And now we're about to engage in a phase of our decades-long journey together that, quite frankly, scares me. We are still one of the most powerful voices for the gospel in the valley, certainly not the only one, but one of the leading voices for Christ in the Victor Valley. And now we find ourselves at another one of those proverbial forks in the road where this time it is going to require a full court press by everybody who claims to be an attender at HDC. Over the last three plus decades, our church family has always risen to the challenge, whatever the challenge was that God gave us. And while our gifting as leaders, mine certainly included while that gifting is limited, for the most part, it has been sufficient for whatever reason or series of reasons, it has been sufficient to issue a challenge and then see enough of you respond to meet that challenge. But the challenge we face now is beyond my ability to motivate you. All that to say, I believe God is going to move as he always does. We've been in this business in this town for a long time. And we've seen him answer the bell over and over and over again. But that still doesn't keep me from feeling a bit overwhelmed myself these days. And so I asked for this series. And it isn't just so I could talk to you, it was so that I could read these passages again. And I have told people for a long time, if you want to learn the Bible, truly learn the Bible, study it as if you had to teach it. Because if you are accountable for what you are studying, accountable to teach it or declare it or be an example of it, then that word, that divine word will be buried in your heart to a depth that simply being a student will not afford you. And some of you aren't teachers, and I'm not saying that you need to necessarily become a teacher. I'm just saying study the Bible as if you were. And every day that you wake up, if you look into the word of God and you say to God, God, I'm going to be responsible to share this material with someone in the near future. I'm going to need your help to understand it myself. See, I knew I would be in that position with you. And so I volunteered this series for the entire church, maybe 
but for me, certainly. The first prayer is one out of Daniel chapter 6. It's an interesting prayer because it's a prayer that we know was prayed, but we don't actually get to read what was prayed. And the catalyst for this prayer is one guy's dilemma because he was squeezed on the one hand by his adversaries and on the other hand by a system that simply would not bend, a legal system that would not bend. And so he's being pressed from this side by his enemies and he's being held in on this side by this unbending culture that he found himself living in. And so our theme today reflects something we've all been, overwhelmed by resistance. Of people might, we might consider adversarial or the resistance of systems by the very design that suppress what we believe is important. And I think you would say the same thing that I have said over and over, even in recent weeks as we prepared for this, this series. We do have those out there who seem to be adversarial and we certainly live in a system that suppresses truth. And so maybe we can all learn something today. I hope the story of Daniel begins a long time ago, by the way, during a period in world history when Babylon had become the dominant world power. And so this Jewish teenager, a kid named Daniel, who was anticipating a life of wealth and influence in his homeland, all of a sudden finds himself in a different environment. Those aspirations of prosperity were extinguished pretty quickly when his God, your God, my God, decided that he, God, was no longer going to defend Daniel's country because of their sin. And as a result, Judah was conquered. Daniel chapter one, verse one, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, King of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and just wailed on it, besieged it. And so Daniel becomes this initial group of deportees. They had to leave Jerusalem. They were deported essentially as slaves to Babylon. And the process of acculturation, the brainwashing began immediately as Daniel was admitted to a program for service to his new pagan Babylonian king, a man named Nebuchadnezzar. Over time, as the story evolves, Daniel finds favor in the Babylonian political system because of his astute leadership, acumen, and because of his spiritual insights, he begins like cream to rise to the top. And the first four chapters of Daniel provide uh, some amazing stories about Daniel and others who helped reshape the spiritual landscape of their new environment in, in Babylon. But chapter 5 ends with this abrupt uh, dissolving of the Babylonian empire. And Daniel finds himself in a world dominated by the new kids on the block. The Babylonians are out. And now the Medo-Persian empire has overwhelmed Babylon. Daniel chapter 5 verse 30 concludes that chapter by saying that very night Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain and Darius, or Darius the Mede, took over the kingdom at the age of 62. And so chapter 6, which is our theme chapter today, begins with Darius the Mede as the new most powerful man in the world. And as is the case in all of the stories of Daniel, the spotlight isn't on Daniel. He's our hero, certainly. But the spotlight will be on this other guy. The spotlight will be on this guy, Darius, whom God is going to save because of the relationship that he shares with our good friend, Daniel. And we learn something immediately about Darius, this new ruler. And the thing we learn is that he's really good at ruling. He's a very proficient administrator. Look at chapter 6, verse 1. It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps, which is another term for governors, to rule throughout the region with three administrators over them, one or first of whom 
was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. So here we have King Darius setting up this administrative structure where everybody who is involved in leadership in that government would all be accountable to one of three administrators, Daniel being one of the three. Look at verse three. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among those three administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. And that bothered the rest. Why? Because they were jealous. Because Daniel's getting some playtime here that they wanted. And so the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they couldn't do it. They tried to criticize Daniel or find some weak spot in his ability as a leader as he conducted uh, the government, and they could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy, he was neither corrupt nor negligent. He worked hard, and he was honest. You want a formula for success in the business community? Work hard and be honest. And you watch how you rise like cream, like Daniel, to the top of your organization. And, and why is that a, a, a cool formula? Just, just a little rabbit trail on the side here. Because how many people do you know that work hard? Not many. And how many people do you know that are honest? Not many. So if you can put one plus one together, bro, you got two, and that's good. Two's good. Okay. So finally, these guys said, we'll never find any basis for charges. We're never going to find anything against Daniel that we can criticize him for unless it has something to do with the law of his God. The only way we're going to be able to find a, a, a suitable criticism to take to Darius the king, it has to have something to do with, with his spiritual life, with the fact that he's committed to his God. You know, that's the best kind of criticism that you or I could ever hear, that we're too committed to God. Can you imagine that conversation? Oh, I, I don't like that guy. Put your name in the blank. I don't like that gal. Put your name in the blank. Well, why don't you like them? They're just too committed to their God. They're just too good a Christian. They bug me so much because they're so much like Jesus. What a great, what a great criticism. I, I can't stand that guy. He's too good of a husband. I can't stand that guy. He's too loyal of an employer. I can't stand her because she's too selfless a steward, too giving as a mother. Or to hear that because we believe that Jesus is the only way to God, we're not fit for public service in the United States, as we heard over the last couple of weeks in a United States Senate confirmation hearing being persecuted for doing the right thing, being persecuted for being the right kind of guy, the right kind of gal. You know, this series is about prayer and how God defends us in situations when we feel like we're overwhelmed, like we feel when we feel like we're way over our heads and we're just trying to, you know, keep above the waterline. We don't want to drown underneath this mass, underneath this burden. But we should never be, here's another principle, never be underwhelmed about the connection between God's responsiveness to prayer and living an honorable life. Never be underwhelmed or never take for granted that lesson, you guys. We always want God to answer our prayers, but there always seems to be a thread connecting a faithful life and God moving on behalf of his people as they pray. Daniel's prayers undoubtedly were fueled by his faithfulness. When Peter weighed in on this subject in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 16, this is what he wrote. Keep a clear conscience, y'all, so that those who speak maliciously against your what kind of behavior? Against your good behavior. Against your faithfulness. That they may be ashamed of their slander. It's better if it's God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. You see, suffering for doing evil reduces your influence. And you can just join in and you can, you know, be the bad boy or the bad gal. You can kind of hang with your homies and play the same game as they do. You can be just like them. You'll never have influence in people's lives when you're just like them. But when you do the right thing, and as a result, you suffer for doing the right thing. Over time, what happens? Your influence is actually elevated. And I'll tell you what, what goes around comes around. 
and God will honor your faithfulness. Some of you right now are in a situation, you're in a social setting where people are, are seducing you <laughs> to, the, to the dark side. They're, they're trying to get you to you know, play, you know, when in Rome, you know, play like the Romans play. And you're wondering if it's worth standing up and taking the shots for being the right kid, the right guy, the right gal. I'm telling you, you hang in there because God will, like he did in Daniel's case. So as you'll see this unfold, this story is incredible. This is one of the most famous stories in the Bible and most of you don't even understand the story yet. That cream will rise to the top and you, you will see what I'm talking about. So anyway, okay, got to stay focused here because we only have four more hours. All right, Daniel chapter six, verse six. So these administrators and the satraps, they go to the, as, as a group to the king and they say, may King Darius live forever. You always say that when you go to the king, like, hey man, you're great. And then verse seven, the royal administrators, prefects, the satraps, the advisors, governors, all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce a decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, like you're all out in a bag of chips. So we want you to be the recipient of all of the worship of everybody in the Medo-Persian Empire because you are so amazing. <laughs> really, I am? Oh yeah, we all agree. Everybody should be worshiping you, man. And if they don't, they should be thrown into the lion's den. Now your majesty, issue the decree, put it in writing so it cannot be altered in accordance with the laws of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. You see, that's the legal system that wouldn't give in. The law of the Medes and the Persians was huge in that empire. The law was the law. It did not bend for you. It could not be repealed for you. And so Darius is like hearing all these people give him compliments about how great he is. And he's so caught up in this moment this egotistical glory. He put the decree in writing. Oh, that's a great idea. I think everybody should. I, I agree with you guys. I think everybody ought to worship me. Remember, though, bad ideas usually start out as good ideas. And this seems like a good idea. It's not going to last a good idea. It's going gonna, it's gonna to change. So, so when, when Solomon earlier wrote in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Darius is going to learn that principle big time in just, in just a few minutes. See, we all have egos, and you let those egos get out of hand, and you got problems. Your relationship's sour, and your efforts are less productive. That's bottom line. Your life is worse when you can't manage your ego. You got one, I got one. Got to manage it, man. Never read your press clippings. Just be thankful you're not going to hell. If you're in Christ, you're not. That'll keep you humble. Verse 10. So Daniel learns that the decree had been published, and he's reading the decree. I don't know how he read the decree. Probably got an email. And uh, he goes home, and he says, oh, I have to worship King Darius, or, or I'll be thrown into the lion's den. And so what did he do? He went home to his upstairs room where, watch this, the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and he prayed, giving thanks to who? His God. Just as he had done when? His whole life. And so these guys went as a group and found Daniel praying. Isn't it interesting that they just happened to be walking by the open window when Daniel was praying? Except this was, this was a hit job. Y'all, this was, this was so carefully calculated by these guys. They, they found him praying and asking God for help. That's the prayer. Actually, that's Daniel's response to the threat, and this is his formula. You're going to have to fill in some blanks real quick here because we're not going to put these, we'll put these back up later, but, but just fill in the blanks. Windows were open, okay? Windows were open. You'll see why that's really important soon. Three times a day, this is the Daniel prayer formula because we're gonna do this soon. He's on his knees, on his knees. He gave thanks and then he asks for help. See, you break down these verses and you have five steps for Daniel's prayer. 
Now I'm thinking, and we're talking about the story of Daniel and the lion's den. You know how the story ends. See this? There is a reason why stories end the way they end in the Bible. And you can look on both sides of the ledger that way. Whether they end poorly or they end well, there are reasons. Here you go, Dan. This is your example to Christ church. 70 years, 70 years since the deportation. See, Daniel's an old guy. You know, 70 years after surviving a crushing national humiliation, after being abducted from his homeland, after the spiritual oppression of two different world cultures, and now here is yet another threat on his life. And what does Daniel do? Same thing I always did. Daniel is so consistent with his faith disciplines. And I believe that kind of success is only possible when your motive for doing the right thing is to simply honor God. You see, there are a lot of motives for pursuing faith. There are many motives for doing the right thing. And we could just create a, a checklist of them. Why, why do you pursue faith? Why would you do what Daniel did? Uh, to get a pat on the back? Have somebody say, wow, you're pretty spiritual. To elevate yourself that way? To generate a hostile re reaction. Some people just like to egg people on as they say. Some people like to do the right thing just so folks who don't like it won't like it. Just stick it in their face. Or is your motive for doing the right thing simple, pure? I, I love Jesus. That's why. I don't need anybody to know it. If they're watching, fine. If they're not, that's fine too. I certainly don't need an award or a trophy or a pin or a pat on the back. Because if Jesus is not happy, nobody's happy. And if Jesus is happy with my life, that's all I need. Many of the profound things that Daniel said are recorded in these chapters. But it's just not the things he said that made a difference in his life. It's what he did. It's how he lived. You ask him to discuss faith and he'll engage any king, any wise man, anybody. And, and if you read the book of Daniel, you will know that. You don't ask him and he'll go about his business simply demonstrating how much God has done for him and giving thanks through his life to this God that has given him the opportunities that God has given him. This is this is simply one of the ways a man of faith honored God. Jewish tradition required this in terms of prayer. If you're traveling outside of the country, you pray facing Israel. If you're in Israel, you pray facing Jerusalem, which is Mount Zion, the holy city. If you're in Jerusalem, you pray facing the temple, which is you know where it's going on. And if you're in the temple area, you pray facing the holy of holies, where God's presence actually resided in that Jewish system where God was. And so these guys see Daniel praying and his windows are open and he's facing Jerusalem. He's facing Israel, Jerusalem. I mean, it's out there. It's hundreds of miles away. So they go to the king and they spoke to him about his royal decree. Did, did, king, didn't you publish a decree that during the next 30 days nobody could pray to any God or human except to you or they'd be thrown into the lines and we, we thought we remember that that was a decree you signed and the king said well absolutely decree stands in accordance with the laws of the Medes and the Persians which can't be repealed and then they said to the king well you know we just happened to be on our lunch break and we're going down the street and we saw Daniel you remember Daniel one of the exiles from Judah you know he pays no attention to you your majesty or to the decree you put in writing, he still is praying three times a day. And you know what happened at that point? <laughs> the king recognized he'd been played by these guys. And that his pride as king, as the self-glorified deity, if you will, that pride was gonna actually kill someone that he cared about. See, look at verse 14. When the king heard this, he was greatly what? Distressed. Oh, man. 
Once again, that's why Peter said this. All of you clothe yourselves with humility. I'm just saying. Because God opposes the proud and he shows favor to the humble. Suddenly the plot shifts and Daniel isn't the one who's overwhelmed by his adversaries. You know who's overwhelmed by his adversaries? Darius is. He's now in that position because of his pride. Darius now is in worse shape than Daniel is. Because as Peter said, his problem, his problem isn't for doing the right thing. That's Daniel's problem. Because Daniel did the right thing. Darius' problem is for doing the wrong thing. And Peter said, oh, that's a lot worse. So anyway, verse 14, King hears this. He's greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel. Made every effort until sundown to save him. And then the men went as a group to the king and said, remember your majesty that that can't change, right? Because of that infamous law book of the Medes and the Persians. No decree or edict that the king issues can change that, right? Darius tried to find a way. And oftentimes you can do things to fix a problem. But in this case, to save Daniel's life would have required Darius to set in motion the unraveling of the empire's entire legal system. And if that was even possible, it would have also created a number of other problems that he would have had to resolve at a later time. And so he did what he had to do. In verse 16, he gave the order. They brought Daniel, threw him into the lion's den. And the king said to Daniel, may your God, whom you serve, continually. I love that word, especially in this context. Not may your God that you serve once in a while, your God that you serve when you drag yourself, you know, out of your comfort zone and get over to the church to go to a service. Not your God whom you think about once in a while, but may your God whom you serve continually may he rescue you and so a stone was brought placed over the mouth of the den the king sealed it with his own signet ring and the rings of his nobles I'm sure his seal was more reluctant than all the seals of the nobles Daniel's situation cannot be changed it would have taken a committee decision to legally open the den Darius was incapable of himself sneaking down in the middle of the night to let Daniel go, which meant that he was helpless. Here's the king, and he's helpless. And when he couldn't fix the problem, he had no choice but to worry about the outcome. He couldn't do what the psalmist said, trust in God at all times, you people. Psalm 62, 8, trust in God at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Darius didn't have a refuge. Darius was his own self-made God. I think he's a pretty good example of what any other God can do when you're overwhelmed for you. Can I just put it out there? Nothing. Nothing. Go ahead and worship the world, worship the system, worship your celebrity friends. Worship whatever you want, but when push comes to shove and you're up against the wall, what can they do for you? King returned to his palace, spent the night without eating. See, that's, that's what they can do for you, nothing. And so he's so jacked up inside. His system is so in knots, he can't even eat. Typically, the king would have the funniest comedians and the best musicians in the empire come and entertain him in the evening, and he didn't even want that. He couldn't sleep. The first light of dawn. See, you can't miss the nuances in this story. The first light of dawn. The king gets up. He didn't wake up. Dude hadn't slept all night. 
But the moment he had the opportunity, he hurried. He hurried to the lion's den and he came to the den. And he called to Daniel in an anguished voice. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to rescue you from the lions? And out of the bottom of the den, may the king live forever. You know what Daniel's heart was? That his friend Darius would live forever. My God sent his angel, shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me. God takes care of us when we're faithful. I, and I haven't done anything against you either, your majesty. I hope you know that. And the king was so excited because he's thinking, may the king live forever. He, he's never met a lion that could articulate that that clearly. Must be Daniel. And he gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. Daniel's lifted from the den. No wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. See, Darius had, had not understood the people around him. He actually let, him, let himself believe that the people around him had his best interest in their hearts. Here's a principle for you. You wouldn't worry so much about what other people think of you if you only realized how seldom they do. These men weren't looking out for the king's interests. These guys weren't looking out for what's in the best interest of the empire. Of the, of the nation, the national entity that they claimed to serve. After all, Daniel had been the most effective leader in the realm, the most effective leader in the world, spanning two global empires over 70 years. Nobody could ever find anybody better at running a government than this guy. But they were jealous of Daniel. They were willing to do whatever it took to get rid of him. And so at the king's command, what did I tell you a minute ago, what goes around comes around. The king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in, thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and kids. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Why? Because the lions were like hungry. <laughs> First glance, the fact that the families were killed, even the kids. I mean, we read that and we think, yikes. Seems to indicate that <laughs> Darius is just really, really mad at these guys. <laughs> but the law... Remember the law of the Medes and the Persians? Remember how unbending it was in Daniel's case? You know what the law of the Medes and the Persians also said? That if anyone was found guilty of a conspiracy, they and their families would be executed. Those guys would certainly have known about that law before they planned their little conspiracy, which reveals how much they hated Daniel, the depth of their hatred for Daniel that they would jeopardize their own lives, but more than that, the lives of their wives and their kids in order to take Daniel down. It's not our topic today, but it's amazing how much bitterness blocks out your common sense. The law that these guys knew wouldn't give Darius any wiggle room in dealing with Daniel. Turns out, didn't give Darius any wiggle room in dealing with them either. Verse 25, Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language in all the earth, may you prosper greatly. I want my kingdom to prosper. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he's... He's the true God. He endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. How do I know that? Because he rescued my friend Daniel from the power of the lions. That's how I know it. And so Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. So his testimony goes on beyond even this king's reign. 
And I believe that like Nebuchadnezzar before Darius in the opening chapters of Daniel's book, I believe this guy becomes a man of faith through his interaction with Daniel. And by the way, who was the one in bondage that night? It wasn't Daniel. Darius had a tougher night than Dan did. And God delivered Daniel. This is what we talk about. This is where I'm going to land here. We talk about God delivering Daniel from the lion's den. You guys, that's not the story here. The story is God delivered Darius from himself. See, this illuminates the purpose for Daniel's life. He's not the center of attraction. You talk about all of the great stories in the book of Daniel, and there are about a half a dozen stories there that you have heard of. If you've been in the church for very long at all, you probably come across these stories. These are great stories. But Daniel's not the star in any of the stories. We focus on what happened to Daniel. He is the one we talk about. He's the one we remember. But he, he's never the focus of a story. And that's because Daniel represents you and me. And you and I aren't the focus of our stories either. It's not about you. It's not about me. Here's a principle for you. God designs our circumstances to create connectivity between God and the people around us. That's what this is. That's why we're feeling overwhelmed. That is why we cry out to God. And when God rescues us, he's not even just rescuing us. He's rescuing a Darius in our lives. Daniel in the lion's den. Daniel being saved from the jaws of the lion. You know what that is? That's a side story. That's what that is. See, we look at the difficulties in our lives. We say, oh God, deliver me like you delivered Daniel from the lion's den. Oh Lord, save me like you saved Daniel's three friends from the fiery furnace. You remember that story too, right? How many times have we heard sermons and that's the takeaway? God, save us. God can save you from difficulty just like you saved Daniel, just like you saved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and those others involved in those great stories from the book of Daniel. But the point of those stories, it wasn't about the furnaces. It wasn't about the lion's den. It was about the people who were in the arena with those pe people. Those who are in the arena with Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, it's about those people who are watching all those stories come to pass. You look at the litany of changed lives in the book of Daniel. You look at Ashpenaz, the chief of court officials, the court officials in chapter one. You look at Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, chapters two and four. You look at Arioch, the commander of the king's guard in chapter two. You look at all the politicians in chapter three. You look at the queen in chapter five. You look at Belshazzar, the king of Babylon in chapter five. And now Darius, the king of the Medes and the Persians in chapter six. His lives are changed. See, those are the stories of Daniel. Those people frame the reason why Daniel was so great. As you know, I'm a Bruin. Just saying. Some of you need to deal with that a little more effectively, I think. <laughs> But I'm not only a UCLA fan, I'm also a Laker fan. <laughs> and last week, those kingdoms merged. As at the NBA draft, the Lakers took as a second pick in the draft a Bruin to lead Laker Nation in the process of rebuilding to bring back the good old days of Showtime, which we vaguely remember. And Coach Luke Walton said about drafting this young man, Lons, Lonzo Ball, he said, and I quote, when he's on the floor, all four guys out there with him become instantly better. Now this may be a stretch, but Daniel is Lonzo Ball on steroids in a spiritual sense, of course, because when people Enter Daniel's world. Those people all became better people instantly. 
And that's important because that's why we're here. Like Paul in writing the Romans, he said, I've written you quite boldly on some points to remind you of them again because of the grace God gave me to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. He gave me the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. What is Paul saying? He's saying this is not about me. We love the Apostle Paul. We read the letters of the Apostle Paul. We elevate the Apostle Paul. He's a hero to us who study the New Testament. And Paul here is saying, this is not about me. But those I serve God with. Therefore, I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I've said and done. It's those Gentiles that wrote Paul's story. It's that list of individuals in the book of Daniel that wrote Daniel's story. And it's the people around you they're writing your story. It's not about you. It's not about me. This has always, always, always been about them. Anyway, getting back to Daniel's prayer formula. Windows opened. Just saying. Doesn't matter who sees you when you pray. That's the lesson. You don't have to stand up and shout. He didn't hang his head out the window and start screaming his prayers. Dear Heavenly Father! But he's not going to close the window. That's for sure. Three times a day. What does your prayer regimen look like? Would you even say you pray one time a day? Three disciplined times a day. On his knees, reflecting an attitude of humility. And I would say this. There is nothing like praying on your knees. You say, well, what if I just have the attitude? What if I just have a humble spirit? Oh, I'm not saying that. Won't be fine. I'm just saying, why don't you get on your knees? Somebody might see me. Wouldn't want that now, would we? He gave thanks. See, we're not the focus. It's not about us. See, if you feel as if your circumstances are all about you, oh, God, save me from the lion's den. <laughs> then you'll not only... <laughs> have a problem being faithful, you're only going to give thanks in times of prosperity. You're not going to give thanks when your adversaries have surrounded you or the system is stacked against you. If you think it's about you, you will only <laughs> give thanks in the good times. Why? Because it's about you, right? But if you can turn the spotlight off of you, just like crank that thing around and start focusing on the people around you, then there's a chance your dental lions can change somebody's mind about Jesus Christ. And he asked for help. I don't need any commentary there. Lord, I'm feeling overwhelmed and I need your help. See, that's the Daniel prayer challenge. Now, this is, I'm, my time is done. I know, I know. Nobody knows that like I know that because I'm looking at the clock. You may not be. Here we go. Daniel prayer challenge. This, you say, what, what, what is this? I'll tell you what this is. I'm going to ask you to do this this week. What's your takeaway? You're going to take 10 minutes and pray every morning. If you're married, pray with your spouse. Before you leave, go out for the day. Just you and your sweetheart. If you're not married or you're not with your spouse, if you're traveling, whatever, just you. And you're going to give thanks to God. For whatever comes to mind, just say thank you, Lord. And if you can't think of anything to thank the Lord for, just thank him you're in Christ, you're not going to hell. Thank you for that, Lord. And then you're going to pray for a softened heart. Maybe your heart needs to be softened. You're going to ask God to enhance your personal integrity and spiritual growth and for the personal challenges that you're facing in your life. The systems that are against you, the people that seem to be adversaries to you, you're going to pray about those things. And then, <laughs> at noon, <laughs> you're going to take 10 minutes and you're going to do the same thing all over again. You start out by saying, uh, Lord, by the way, thanks. I forgot about something this morning I should have said thanks for. Now I remember. And then you're going to pray for Pastor Tom and the other spiritual leaders in your life and your church for your specific church site. If you're in Apple Valley, there's a lot going on right now in terms of 
that evolving ministry. Same thing's true in Phelan. Same thing's true in Asperia. Same thing's true in Victorville. You're going to pray for your specific church site and the community it serves. And then for your civic and government leaders. And you can take more than 10 minutes if you'd like. If you'd like to name them or group them, I would just say they all need your prayer. Everybody on that list is in need of prayer. Your prayer. 10 minutes. And then you're going to take 10 minutes at the end of the day. And maybe if you have been uh, living in an immediate family context, you, again, have a spouse, or maybe you have kids, whoever it is that you end the day with in your, um, your abode, then you're going to pray. You're going to pray for your family, for the other members of your oikos, and for our broken world that so desperately needs Jesus. This is going to take 30 minutes a day. Can I just say that your life is in need of this? And you don't know it yet, but you're going to be able to connect dots to resolution and impact and the spiritual landscape of your world being transformed. You're going to be able to connect in the future those dots with this discipline. And Daniel chapter 6 is proof of that. And I, I'm, I'd just be excited to hear what happens to you when you decide uh, to accept that child. So you good to go? All right, okay, you got your marching orders. Don't leave yet. You got your marching orders, so let me pray for you. Father, I just lift up this church family on every one of these sites in Apple Valley and Hesperia and Phelan here in Victorville. I pray that your church, not just the pastor, Tom, not just the pastors of the church, not just the leaders of the church, but your church, everyone who claims the name of Jesus and attends High Desert Church would pray this week Three times each day, boldly, uh, gratefully, asking you to change the world around us. With everybody's head bowed and your eyes closed right now, some of you may not know Jesus yet, and that's a problem. It's a big problem for, for you. And so the prayer that you pray initially in in getting this whole Christian life on track is ABC. Lord, I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus can save me, and I choose. I admit, I believe, I choose. I choose to place my faith in Jesus. I, I ask him to be my savior and my leader in that one ultimate, astoundingly great name, Jesus Christ, we pray. All God's children said, amen. amen.